The final bit uh, that I wanted to talk about was just kind of what type of data do you pull out of a pedestrian network and why would you pull that data out? So the first one is network performance measures. These are similar to the network performance measures that you might get in vSIM uh, from the vehicle side. Basically, this will show you network-wide measurements. Uh, they're useful for things like evacuation planning, for example. You can see time in network and travel time, average travel time. So you can see, you know, at, as, a, as a whole, how long does it take for pedestrians to exit the stadium? It's also good for scenario comparison and statistical analysis. So if you're looking for like an average level of improvement, right, you'll look at the network-wide performance measures from one scenario to the next to give you your level of improvement as a facility, right, as a, as a whole on facility. What is the average delay for the facility? What is the average uh, density of the facility or travel time? And there's not a lot to it. Basically, what you'll do is you'll just come in, you'll activate your, your uh, pedestrian network performance measures. And then once you've run the simulation, you'll look at your result list for pedestrian network performance results. And here we can see we have different types of outputs for speeds, stop time, uh, pedestrians entered versus arrived. This means pedestrians that have been inputted into the network versus pedestrians that have exited the network. And then pedestrians actual shows you how many pedestrians are remaining in the network at a particular time. This is especially useful for things like evacuation planning. The next one we look at are pedestrian travel times. So you can throw down travel time markers just like you can in vSIM. So in this case, uh, we've thrown down travel time markers to measure how long does it take to walk from the door to the platform? How long does it take to walk from this concourse onto the mezzanine? So that way we can measure how long does it, you know, how long does it take to get through the queues and security and things like that. Um, as far as those go, you can see them as here's pedestrian travel time measurements, right? So we have one going down to this platform. Uh, we have other ones going to the other platforms. And so you can measure different travel times there. Result lists, uh, pedestrian travel time results. And so here we've taken a lot of time to make sure to name everything so you can see how many pedestrians went to each one of these locations and what was their average travel time in a given time interval. Again, these can be origin and destination, or they could be, and or I guess I should say, they could be broken up into different uh, subsections of the network. So, you know, what is the travel time from the curb to the gate? And also what is the travel time specifically through the ticketing concourse? And what is the travel time through the security concourse? The next one is uh, getting more specific. So we look at specific areas in ramp performance measures. So you can look at counts in certain zones. You can look at things like social distancing. We have an output called nearest neighbor distance. So you can see uh, in addition to just what is the average density of the area, you can look at what is the physical different distance between people. So if you're doing something like, you know, 2020, are you planning for a pandemic or something like that? You can look at what is the raw distance between, between pedestrians, as well as things like pedestrian delay and experience density. And these are at the, at the area and ramp level. So each one of our areas and ramps will output a specific uh, delay, density, travel time, things like that. And we can look at those in the result lists under area results. We can look at them specifically for our ramps as well. So you can pull out ramp results and see what is uh, the count of pedestrians going up and down different ramps or uh, delays and densities on various ramps. Finally, we can generate heat maps. So this is a little bit different than the area results because what VSIM does is regardless of the area, it subdivides the network into predefined grid cells. And so what we can see is in our Farragut West model, for example, uh, we have a, a graphic overlay called experienced density. And so here we can see that it's defined grid cells, I think down to one foot cells. Let me just double check on that. Pedestrian grid cells, um, Okay, so a third of a foot. 
uh, for as far as uh, the edge of a square, right? And so each one of these is is taking uh, uh, a sub area and it's measuring that that grid for things like density, volume, speed, and the like. And you can take a look and see where are pedestrians clumping up, where are they moving freely. Um, and this also shows up in 3D, so you can also create nice visuals from a presentation perspective. And you can see where the hotspots are, right? Now, in my experience, hotspots typically will show up in two key places. Uh, one are at obvious bottlenecks, like the top of stairs or security terminals. But one that's not so obvious that people need to consider are things like right angles. Right angles with pedestrian flows typically will create a lot of congestion because everybody wants to cut that corner. And so the people on the inside typically get boxed out and kind of get stuck and have to slow down. That's why specifically on Farragut, we see that the, uh, that the mezzanine level is built in a very specific way where you don't see any right angles on the pedestrian movements, right? So the pedestrians come in and they flow down like this. And then uh, when they're leaving, they flow up like this. And those two flows are meant to avoid each other, right? And so this is how you can use uh, VizWalk to plan out a pedestrian space to avoid situations like this, where you have a large flow that needs to take a right turn and then another conflicting flow that also is taking a right turn and it's kind of a blind corner, right? So um this is where pedestrian grid cells can really help in this case we're showing uh experienced density and what vsim has an output for is density as well as experience density the difference is just there is the raw density of a space which can be outweighed by uh the the sheer size of the space right if i switch over to density you see there's a lot of blue because it's measuring all these areas uh for density but experience density is what does it feel like to the pedestrians, right? So it, it only looks at density around a specific pedestrian. So what does it feel like for that particular pedestrian? You can see, for example, here, there's a large difference between the calculated density and the experience density in terms of where the heat map is, right? So it doesn't feel as dense as it might calculate out to be. All right. And so those are the major components of a VizWalk network. Uh, we didn't really talk too much about platforms or, or crosswalks, but that'll be in an upcoming session. So uh, if you're more interested in things like, how do we manage shared spaces between pedestrians? How do we manage uh, boarding and alighting from public transit? Or how do we manage mid-block crossings with pedestrian beacons? Uh, we're going to be doing another VizWalk tooltips in July uh, where you can get more information on that. We're also doing a virtual training in July for VizWalk specifically. Uh, so if any of you are more interested in that, please, again, here's the link, uh, ptv.to slash learn. Uh, you can go there, check out what events we have coming up in the future.